Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India A key landmark of this lake district is the number of lakes plus some hills and dales rivers around this area. Wordsworth along with his friends used to walk around all these places and feel happy about uh, the company of nature. So, here in this passage apart from looking at his response to river Darwent, we also see how he played in the landscape called Skidda mountain. Let us begin our reading. A tempting playmate whom we a dealer loved, oh many a time have I a five year child in a small mill race severed from his stream made one long bathing of a summer's day, passed in the sun and plunged and basked again alternate all a summer's day or scored the sandy fields leaping through flowery groves of yellow ragwood or when rock and hill the woods and distant skiddas lofty height were bronzed with deepest radiance stood alone beneath the sky as if I had been born on Indian plains and from my mother's hut had run abroad in wantonness to sport a naked savage in the thunder shower. Wordsworth feels as if he was a naked savage in his play with nature's lap. So, we can find that he has been moving around from his mother's hut to different places in and around his house and he enjoys the company of nature as a child. Wordsworth plays not only plays with the water or with plants or with the locations around him, he also plays a spoiling sport with birds and other small animals. So, here we have the beginning of this outdoor game. Fair sea time had my soul and I grew up fostered alike by beauty and by fear, much favoured in my birthplace and no less in that beloved vale to which ere long we were transplanted. There were we let loose for sports of wider range. Sometimes it befell in these night wanderings that a strong desire overpowered my better reason and the bird which was a captive of another toil became my prey and when the deed was done I heard among the solitary hills low breathings coming after me and sounds of undistinguishable motion steps almost as silent as a turf they trod. We understand Wordsworth's response to nature in this uh, passage in much more detail as we can see he wanted to learn something more about the natural surroundings. So, some kind of uh, temptation he had to go around and steal the eggs from birds and he felt unhappy about it because he heard among the solitary hills low breathings coming after me and sounds of undistinguishable motion probably to warn him that this was something wrong that he should not do. That is why we have this idea of fostering alike by beauty and by fear. Nature has both beauty and fear. However, Wordsworth more often focuses on the beautiful benign side of nature. This outdoor game continues not only just stealing from a birds, uh, a captive birds uh, eggs here he does something more, he almost plunders that is why he uses the word plunder here. Nor less when spring had warmed the cultured whale, moved we as plunderers where the mother bird had in high places built her lodge, though mean our object and inglorious, yet the end was not ignoble. Oh, when I have hung above the raven's nest by knots of grass and half inch fissures in the slippery rock, but ill sustained and almost so it seemed suspended by the blast that blew amain shouldering the naked crag. Oh, at that time while on the perilous ridge I hung alone with what strange utterance did the loud dry wind blow through my ear the sky seemed not a sky of earth and with what motion moved the clouds. 
we find words with hanging from a crag being warned by the rushing wind and thought how nature would care for him during his act of plundering. The major lesson is, is very clear to us, Wordsworth is doing something which he ought not to do, but some for some pleasure he does it and so he learns out of this experience. I hung alone and there he learns a lot from through this hanging alone. The lessons are codified in a few lines here, so we call it moral lessons. Dust as we are, the immortal spirit grows like harmony in music. There is a dark inscrutable workmanship that reconciles discordant elements, makes them cling together in one society. How strange that all the terrors, pains and early miseries, regrets, vexations, lassitudes interfused within my mind should ever have born a part and that a needful part in making up the calm existence that is mine when I am worthy of myself, praise to the end. As we said earlier, the modern lessons are beautifully brought up here within this few lines. Dust as we are is a reference to the Bible understanding that we are all from the dust and we go back to the dust and Wordsworth tells very clearly there is a dark inscrutable workmanship that reconciles discordant elements and we can notice how this passage reflects Coleridge's very definition of imagination and poetry as reconcilement of opposites or discordant qualities, both beauty and fear we have reconciled in this lesson from nature for Wordsworth. One of the most important scenes in prelude book 1 is this boat scene, we have three passages here, so we call it uh, boat scene 1 and we will see how Wordsworth while rowing the boat in a lake alone, what he learns we will understand. One summer evening led by her, I found a little boat tied to a willow tree within a rocky cave, its usual home, straight I unclosed her chain and stepping in pushed from the shore. It was an act of stealth and troubled pleasure, not without the voice of mountain echoes did my boat move on, leaving behind her still on either side, small circles glittering idly in the moon until they melted all into one track of sparkling light. But now, like one who rose proud of his skill to reach a chosen point with an unswerving line, I fixed my view, taking the boat from the usual place, he moves on, he rose and he has fixed his eye on one particular place and then let us see how he feels about this troubled pleasure and act of stealth. Wordsworth is aware of it, he is stealing, he is plundering, he is doing something morally wrong, he knows but he has some pleasure and he, he shares that pleasure with us. Here is boat scene 2, upon the summit of a craggy ridge the horizon's utmost boundary far above was nothing but the stars and the grey sky. She was an elfin pinnace, lustily I dipped my oars into the silent lake and as I rose upon the stroke my boat went heaving through the water like a swan, when from behind the craggy steep till then the horizon's bound a huge peak black and huge as if with voluntary power instinct up reared its head, I struck and struck again and growing still in stature the grim shape towered up between me and the stars and still. As we can see Wordsworth is moving up towards his fixed point that is a craggy ridge, but he, we learn that he has been responding to the natural caution or warning from the surrounding. Now let us see boat scene 3. For so it seemed, with purpose of its own and measured motion like a living thing, stood after me with trembling oars I turned and through the silent water stole my way back to the cover of the willow tree. There in her mooring place I left my bark and through the meadows homeward went in grave and serious mood, but after I had seen that spectacle for many days my brain worked with a dim and undetermined sense of unknown modes of being over my thoughts, there hung a darkness, call it solitude or blank desertion. 
Wordsworth's understanding from nature through these unknown modes of being is something excellent, something great. That is why Wordsworth has always been a source of inspiration for us. He shares with us some of the feelings we may have had ourselves when we stole something from others or did something without the knowledge of others. So, he always thinks about this a feeling of being alone rowing the boat in that particular location. We continue with this lesson, we call it beatings of the heart which teach him some valuable lesson. Wisdom and spirit of the universe, the soul that art, the eternity of thought that gives to forms and images a breath and everlasting motion not in vain by day or starlight. Thus from my first dawn of childhood didst thou intertwine for me the passions that build up our human soul not with the mean and vulgar works of man, but with high objects, with enduring things, with life and nature purifying thus the elements of feeling and of thought and sanctifying by such a discipline both pain and fear until we recognize a grandeur in the beatings of the heart. In response to natural surroundings and also our own actions, we learn something from the beatings of our own heart, Wordsworth calls it a grandeur in the beatings of the heart. It these beatings have a purifying effect on Wordsworth and probably we also have such a feeling in us from the caution or warning notes of nature. So, he learns wisdom and spirit from nature. He now, Wordsworth specifically attributes the quality of ministry that is special care taken by nature to train him in understanding life. You presence of nature in the sky and on the earth, you visions of the hills and souls of lonely places. Can I think a vulgar hope was yours when you employed such ministry when you through many a year haunting me thus among my boyish sports on caves and trees, upon the woods and hills impressed upon all forms the characters of danger or desire and thus did make the surface of the universal earth with triumph and delight, with hope and fear work like a sea. As you can see the whole passage is in one question, he asks a question indicating the kind of lessons that he learns from the ministry of nature, the teaching of nature from triumph and delight, from hope and fear, he is learning all about life. It, he compares this natural surroundings with the tempest of the sea where we have this hope and fear uh, of reaching the shore. Apart from the outdoor games, Wordsworth also played some indoor games. Here we have an example of a game of cards. Some plebeian cards which fate beyond the promise of their birth had dignified and called to represent the persons of departed potentates. Oh, with what echoes on the board they fell ironic diamonds, clubs, hearts, diamonds, spades, a congregation piteously akin, cheap matter offered they to boyish wit, those sooty knaves precipitated down with the scarves and taunts like Vulcan out of heaven, the paramount ace, a moon in her eclipse, queens gleaming through their splendors last decay and monarchs surly at the wrongs sustained by royal visages. In these card games have certain pictures like these clubs, hearts, diamonds, spades and he calls them a congregation piteously akin. And we have underlined certain words plebeian, potentates, congregation, precipitated, paramount, even visages to reveal the fact that Wordsworth was not following his own rule of using the common language. These are Latinate words, words of Greek origin which uh, have a high diction which may not be suitable for a common rustic boy, but Wordsworth is using these words probably in his lifetime he understood as he was editing and revising his poem, he found that certain words would be more appropriate here and he has used them. 
and through these games he learnt something from life about his own path in his life. After all these outdoor games and indoor games and the lessons that he has learnt from nature, he specifies the theme that he has to deal with in this poem called the prelude. On one end at least hath been attained my mind, hath been revived and if this genial mood desert me not, forthwith shall be brought down through later years the story of my life, the road lies plain before me, it is a theme single and of determined bounds and hence I choose it rather at this time than work of ampler or more varied argument where I might be discomfited and lost and certain hopes are with me that to thee this labour will be welcome honoured friend. That friend is of course Coleridge. Wordsworth has finally settled down on the story of my life that is his own life for this theme, for the theme of his poem, this epic poem to his friend Coleridge. The road lies plain before him that is also an echo from Milton's Paradise Lost, this we have mentioned as an allusion. We can see a number of contrasts thematically, child and adult, this poem is written by the adult remembering his past childhood nostalgically, radiance and dullness, savage and civilized, soul and body, joy and sadness, solitary and communal, motion and stillness, nature and culture, immortality and mortality, concord and discord, fearless and fearful, feeling and thought, kindness and hatred, presence and absence. As we can see the whole poem is about presence and absence, whatever is absent he is making present in his poem, his mother, his past experiences, everything he makes present to us, danger and safety beauty and ugliness, memory and oblivion, attainment and failure. Specifically Wordsworth talks about this choice of theme for his achievement which might not give him discomfort and lead to failure. He wants to ensure success in writing his epic. There are a number of poetic devices we can see in this poem particularly in these selected passages. One example for hyperbaton that we have is there where we let loose in 306. This can be rewritten as we were let loose there. The allusion we discussed earlier is dust as we are. This has a biblical reference to mean that we human beings are from the earth and they go back to earth. Apostrophe is common here, he addresses his friend and also wisdom and spirit of the universe, something abstract but he addresses as if wisdom is there in front of him. Assonance we have an example here, the leafless trees and every icy crag. Onomatopoeia also we have here in this example, tinkle like iron in line number 443, the sound we can hear. Simile is found in this line from 497, pull at her rein like an impetuous courser. Courser is a swift horse or bird, in this case actually Wordsworth also played with his friends, took a horse and went into the forest, into the woods and had some games. We have simile in bliss like a tempest in line numbers 585 and 86, alliteration we have in line number 622 with fawn and feeble tongue, a tedious tale two examples F sound and uh, T sound we have in this line. Again the last one is allusion to Milton's Paradise Lost, Milton's Paradise Lost ends with the uh, two characters, human characters Adam and Eve going out of the paradise going into the earth. So, they see the road before them to the earth. Similarly, Wordsworth is able to see the road ahead of him to complete his epic. We have a rhyme scheme, rhythm and meter and all that here. In the case of rhyme scheme, we have to understand that this poem is written in blank words. So, it is unrhymed iambic pentameter. Alliteration one more example we have here, may spur me on in manhood now mature, M sound is repeatedly used. There we can see this sound, these two 
alliteration and assonance they are called figures of sound. So, we can say some rhyming effect through repetition of sounds happens here. For assonance and alliteration we have and almost make remotest infancy a visible scene on which the sun is shining. Scene, sun shining we have visible the sa sound is found in this line. Earlier also we have sa sound almost sun. Next we have the example for sesura that is a pause, enjambment, continuation of line from previous line to the next line and end stop lines that is the line stopping at the end. And we have given this scansion, this is iambic uh, pentameter. We were a noisy crew, the sun in heaven beheld not whales more beautiful than ours, nor saw a band in happiness and joy richer or worthier of the ground they trod. On the whole, we can have an impression as follows. Wordsworth perceives nature that is river, lake, everything around him as a playmate as well as a mentor teaching him and his friends lessons in living joyfully and communally. Stealing, plundering and using things of others do come with pleasure and moral instructions also come to him to shape the poet to grow from an innocent child to a wise man. The poet is able to feel and articulate the rhythm of nature thus in a memorable line like this a grandeur in the beatings of the heart which gives peace and harmony to him. The indoor games too provide pleasure to children and shape their sensibility appreciating the game of life. With the renewed spirit Wordsworth decides to write a poem that is a epic poem on the story of his own life for his friend Coleridge. We can consider this poem an epic poem. These are certain features that we normally find in an epic, invocation, statement of theme, epic simile, supernaturalism, in medias res, descent to hell or journey or quest, heroic characters and books, the whole poem being divided into number of books. In the case of invocation, we see that Wordsworth is praying to the general breeze to inspire him to write this poem. Whole of nature actually becomes an inspiration for Wordsworth. He states the theme of his poem as his own story, the story of my life. We find some epic similes in this poem. One memorable epic simile we saw is this William Wallace, the knight who fought for the freedom of Scotland. His name and fame spread like wildflower to the entire country, everywhere. Uh, the, his name was flowering and uh, people are able to remember William Wallace for his act of bravery and heroism in bringing freedom independence to Scottish people. Then we have this supernaturalism in the sense of these rivers, hills, lakes, all other things taking on certain shapes to caution Wordsworth to learn certain lessons in which is right, which is wrong, which is good, which is not good. Then we have this in medias res. The poem begins suddenly, it does not have any kind of beginning, it just starts, Wordsworth starts his journey from one place to another that is to Grasmere, actually he has escaped from London from this oppressive feeling he has escaped that is where he feels a sense of freedom. And then we do not have anything like descent to hell, but we have a journey or a quest, quest for a great achievement in English poetry. So, uh, we have this quest or journey as Wordsworth explores nature and also his own mind to come up with a poem for his friend. The Hirai characters are as we have noted three, one is Wordsworth that is a main hero and his friend is equally though absent equally a great hero and these two are great poets in England or in English poetry as you know. And nature is the most heroic character that we have in Wordsworth's almost all poems and these books have been divided into 14 books. The whole of the prelude has been divided into 14 books, something like cantos we have 
to get an good to get a shape of this epic poem. This is certainly an autobiographical poem as it deals with the life of Wordsworth. All the events that happened in his life or uh, whatever uh, he met with, whatever experience he had in different locations. In book 1 and 2, we have his own childhood and school time experiences and in book 3, his education in Cambridge and in book 4, his uh, summer vacation, in book 5, all his readings and then in book 6, his uh, experience in Cambridge and his journey to the Alps and in book 7, he talks about his life in London and in book 8, in general he talks about nature and the love of man. We have to understand that Wordsworth uh, was uh, fascinated by the revolutionary spirit of France. So, he visited France and so we have three books dealing with his experience in France, uh, book 12 and uh, 13. Uh, deal with imagination and taste in general and the last book is a conclusion where we have an epiphany. There we have a few lines, let us read them now. The emblem of a mind that feeds upon infinity that broods over the dark abyss intent to hear its voices issuing forth to silent light in one continuous stream. That one continuous stream of light, stream of water, stream of river stream of knowledge, stream of experience is what we find in Wordsworth being connected with the rest of humanity, the whole of universe. Therefore, we can consider this poem an autobiographical poem. We have an interesting uh, case of a philosophical reading by one critic called Mook. According to Mook, Wordsworth starts writing about ordinary events of his life, but finds no serious purpose behind them initially but then he discovers a purpose in course of time as he discusses, as he explores, he finds some, some meaning at the end. Nature teaches him the value of the everyday and helps him find the childhood teleology, the pursuit of nature for nature's sake, like a scientist to understand human beings and natural phenomena. We have to remember that Wordsworth wanted actually poets to learn something from science and uh, contribute to more knowledge of human beings. So, Wordsworth himself does this in his own poem to understand nature and also human beings. In summary, we can say that the prelude book 1 is an autobiographical poem. We have discussed the selected passages dealing with the outdoor games, indoor games, where we have both seen and moral lessons. We have to note that nature has this specific aim of educating Wordsworth. It is not just entertainment, it, nature educates Wordsworth and we participate in that education. At the end, we find that Wordsworth is able to choose a theme for his uh, poetry, his uh, epic and we find that this is an epic poem where we find some autobiographical elements with certain philosophical bent because what is ordinary becomes extraordinary. Whatever Wordsworth explores gives him some grand theme to write his own epic in English. Some references are here. If you like, you can read at least one or two, particularly the one on the everyday and the teleological time conflict. This will be useful for all of you. Thank you.